our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. It is good to be together worshiping in this morning's church. As always, we have a lot going on in our life together here as a church. If you notice, when you come in the door, there is a beautiful quilt right over here on from my point of view, the right side. That is the door prize quilt for the Buttons and Bows Bazaar in November. We are already selling tickets to that, so a dollar a piece or let me make sure I don't get this backwards again. Six tickets for $5. I think earlier I said five tickets for $6. That's not a good deal. Six for five is. And that will be the door prize for that event. Also, delays are back to crafting every Friday in the normal time. So ask somebody about that. It will be a great thing getting on some of for buttons and bows. Also, we have several from this church who are out of the women's retreat at Gonzales and so if any of y'all ladies are watching online, well, you should really probably be present there at camp and join the retreat, but hopefully you'll catch it later. Also, next Saturday is men's breakfast, and so if you're a congregant of the male persuasion, we hope to see you there at Rio Ranch at 8 o'clock. That's right, guys. 8, right? Okay. Thanks. So. For some food and fellowship. It'll be a great time. You know, a little bit of a good with all those housekeeping things out of the way, let us get down to the business while we're here. We're just to worship our God who is worthy of worship. Will you join with me in prayer? So oh God, we come before you now thankful that you invite us into your house, that we are the sheep of your pasture. God, we thank you that when we gather here, we know that you are present. God, in this place, may your spirit descend, may we feel you moving among us. And as you do so, God, may our eyes be open to your presence, may our ears be ready to hear your voice, may our hearts be ready to be changed by you, so that in all things we might be equipped for your service, and guide all that we say and do. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing unto you, O oh God, our Creator, and Redeemer, and Sustainer. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Let us stand and sing.
is John 10, 1 through 10. Uh, I'm going to read from the English Standard Version. And the passage title is, I have a good shepherd. Before selecting the exact translation to use, I read seven different ones. Because I found that often translations vary considerably, especially, I'll call it using our an understandable version for our modern when we use words. Uh, I found that this particular parable uh, is pretty consistent. The context and the text is pretty consistent from translation to translation, except for the introductory proclamation. And that ranged from truly, truly, verily, verily, uh, amen, which means it is so, and the Jewish version reads, yes indeed, yes indeed. So it's proclaiming, this is the truth, I am being honest with you. This version starts with, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them. The sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow. But they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. The figure of speech Jesus used with them, excuse me, this figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus then said again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to me. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The sheep, the thief, comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Amen. Well, Bill, you get the gold star for today because I'm preaching on that sermon and I only consulted three translations. So you've got four of them. <laughs> Well, we gather here invited as the sheep of God's pasture, but none of us come empty. We all bring with us praise and joys of our lives, but we also bring concerns. We also bring the things that weigh us down, the ways in which we fall short, and the ways in which this world is very, very different from God's kingdom. So we're going to lift those up together. First in silence, and then I will pray aloud. So with that said, let us go together, church, to the throne of mercy. Thanks to you, O oh God, that you call us your own. We give thanks to you that Jesus Christ, our Lord, is the good shepherd and that he is our gateway to life. O oh God, your word reminds us that we are your sheep. You name us and claim us and call us your own. But oh God, we are also convicted by your word. For the ways in which we try to satisfy our wants and desires and longings and ambitions with ways that are not Jesus Christ. 
So God, for that as we gather here, we ask for you to change our hearts. Forgive us and reconcile us to you once again, we pray. Thankful and fully knowing that every time we come before you, a new start is ours, and that today is the first day of our eternal lives. We God, we come before you now, cognizant of all the ways in which brokenness and hurt and grief and loss permeate this frail world in which we live and these frail bodies which we inhabit, but God, we thank you that this world and us, as frail as we are, are so dear to you. So dear that you would see your Son in flesh to walk among us and know our troubles. So God, right now we know so many struggling with health, God. Specifically, we know of several struggling with cancer. Oh God, for those dealing with that disease and for those who tend to them, who fight that good fight and do that holy work, God, we ask for healing, we ask for strength, we ask for success. And God, in all things, may your spirit guard hearts and minds and bring an abundant measure of peace. Oh God, we look at those that we know suffering loss in this time. Uh, for those who mourn the loss of a family member or a family member in the transition between this life and life and time. But God, we ask that your arm would be around them, that they would feel you guiding them, consoling them, and in due time turning them to joy. For God, as much as so many try to put on a brave face, God, we know that no grief, no loss, no brokenness is hidden from you. You come close when we are in need. Oh God, for the ways in which we see so many things that are broken in this world around us. For broken systems and broken ways of doing things because of our own human faults. Oh God, in these situations, you know them all. May your justice and mercy reign. And may we, your church, do the work you call us to do to make this broken earth more like your whole kingdom in God. Oh God, we come before you now asking in this space and in our lives that you would make us attentive to the voice of our good shepherd. So that all things would be made more like him, more able and ready to follow him into life and life more abundantly. And in doing so, carry your grace, your love, your mercy, and your gospel, your good news to the rest of the world. It is in your Son, our Lord, Jesus Christ's name, that we pray. Amen.
No, I realized then that even though the truck has that signal, it has that relationship with the clicker that makes it mine. When there is this cacophony of other voices, when there is this crowded nature of all of the stuff of a parking garage, of concrete and steel, well, the one horn beam I'm supposed to be listening for is a lot harder to discern and to determine. So hold that thought for just a moment. We are going on in our I Am Statements of Jesus Christ. Two weeks ago he was bread, last week he was light, this week he says he is the sheep gate, or the door for the sheep. Now for us, maybe you're envisioning a barn door, maybe a doggy door for an indoor sheep, I don't know if that's it. <laughs> But most of us are not familiar with kind of the concept here that the Pharisees who he is speaking to have been intimately familiar with, even though they are the right color crowd. Now, in those days, a very specific agricultural practice was that when these nomadic shepherd groups would come into a town or a village for a reason, they would put them in a communal sheepfold. Not with one flock, but possibly several. And that sheepfold would usually be positioned with a house or a business or some kind of building forming the back wall and a windbreak, and then three sides coming around to one entrance, one way in, one way out, which was guarded on a rotating basis because it served two purposes. One, sheep, whether you're talking about pet sheep or us, the sheep of God's flock, or stubborn, like to get out and wander off. So, of course, it had to be guarded and monitored. And two, these sheep were people's livelihoods. They were worth quite a bit, so you didn't want one of the precious little fleece bags getting towed off by some of those So there would be a guard guarding the door who would know, all right, we have five guys, five authorized persons who can come and go with the sheep. But then when one of these shepherds gets in, it's where the amazing thing happens. We've seen the second part of this scripture. Jesus talks about the sheep hear my voice. This is what's amazing. I had to look it up. I thought it was just an, a turn of phrase, but no, really, these shepherds would have a unique voice, a unique call, a unique song, and the sheep literally could hear this. And not all the sheep would run out at once, but the shepherd could call these sheep to him. And they knew it because, well, he had raised them, right? Most of them had been in that flock since they were very small. They knew their shepherd, their one shepherd, meant food. Their shepherd meant movement to good pastures. Their shepherd meant protection from predators, waters, life, and in a sheep spring, abundance. They didn't know what these other shepherds were about. But they knew theirs. They listened. And they followed him through the gate. The gate that both protected them but also was the place of captivity into a place of greater freedom. And I look at this and I'm pretty amazed that they have this kind of control over their sheep, but that maybe that's just a fundamental difference between sheep and cattle. Because I know nothing about sheep, but I have very limited cattle working experience. And let me tell you, they don't give a rip about their shepherd's voice. <laughs> no. It doesn't matter how sweetly I sing to them, what I say to them nicely, what I say to them not nicely, or what cuts of meat I try to reduce them to. They don't know why. Cows just do what cows are going to do. But sheep would follow their shepherds, individual voice, and follow their individual flock from the pen to the pasture. But the Pharisees, they were confused by this. Because if you notice here, Jesus says, my sheep heed my voice, thereby aligning himself with the shepherd. But then he also says, I am the gate for the sheep. I am the sheep door. In their minds, how can he possibly compare himself to both? It would have been very confusing. So are you the door or are you the shepherd? And then in verse 11, he literally says, I am the good shepherd. 
But that's a separate I am statement, so that is what we're talking about next week, so let's not get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> yes, what that means is I did kind of prepare two sermons at once, and we will come back to this same chapter next week. It's kind of like one of the is and ordering fajitas for two and saying, go ahead and bring me the to-go box, because I'm going to take that home. But be warned, when I say that in Mamacitas, but also when I say it here, I might dig in to the box a little bit before I get there, and we're going to hope there's enough left for us to later. Stay tuned next week. It could be interesting, church. But then you can't really separate the identity here from the way the sheep get where they're going and the shepherd who tends, protects looks after them. The Pharisees are having a hard time following this which one, who, what are you saying? And Jesus is basically saying, I'm all that. Jesus has this unique way of being able to be all things he needs to be at once. It's kind of special. And so it is part of this good shepherd discourse that we will be looking at today and next week. But the way the gate, the door for the sheep. It's exclusive. Jesus is laying out an exclusive claim to that which is his, saying, I am the one who protects, I am also the one who leads out, I am the way, and no other is. And to understand kind of what he might be meaning by this, we've got to know where this text is situated. It's John 10, and the very last words before our scripture reading Bill read for us today is Jesus squaring off of the Pharisees and then going and encountering the man being healed by staying home. Our last I am statement, I am light, comes just before that. Jesus says, I am light, and he heals a man who is blind. He says, I am the way, and my sheep hear my voice. Directly after, a man could not see him, but heard his voice, obeyed his command, and then received life abundant because of it. And then in the next chapter is the story of raising Lazarus from the dead. This I am the way and I am the gate is in contrast to the Pharisees who are offering another way. A way, a system of being church, of being faith people, in which whoever dies having kept the most rules, the most religiously, wins. It's a different way. And to them, the man who was born blind obviously had to have some sin within him. We mentioned that last week, or why else would he be here? And in the case of Lazarus, a man who is dead is past the point of hope. There is no conquering that, no beating that. But once again, a man who cannot see Jesus, because one, he's dead, and two, there's an entrance to the tomb in the way. Here's the voice of the shepherd, and it's called out the narrow gate from death to life. This gate discourse, this gate bit of the argument is Jesus saying, whatever you're trying to get, whether that is salvation or life more abundantly and life more complete, there's only one way to it, and that's me. He was the only way to restore that blind man who the Pharisees thought had sinned to his rightful place in society because that blind man heard the voice and answered the call. And it was only Jesus who could bring Lazarus back from the land of the dead as they saw it because Lazarus heard the voice and the call. So what does that part say to you and I, well? We too are looking for life and life more abundantly, aren't we? And Jesus said there that there is no other way, but if we're honest, we kind of try to find abundance, life, identity, belonging, all those things on the hierarchy of needs, the things that make us us in ways that are Jesus Christ. How many times have we thought, I will find pasture or rest when I reach X dollar now to retire? How many times have we said, well, as soon as the kids are off the payroll, I will have rest, I will make it. Or when I make partner, I'll be someone. Or when I get this promotion, or when I meet the right someone, then I'll be there. Then I will arrive. Or maybe whenever the kid finally goes to the bathroom in a toilet, well, that's just in my house. 
<laughs> no, we always seem to have these things, these goalposts we look at. Once I make it there, I'm in the green pasture. I'm by the still waters. But then what people, the goalposts move when there's anything else but Jesus. What we learn is when we're successful, when we have plenty, is the insecurity still there? Yes. Is there still the want for more? Is there still the insecurity? Is there still this idea of now I have to fight to keep all this that I have accomplished? Yes, when we find our identity not as a sheep of the fold, but as whatever we have accomplished, whatever we have done, whoever we are with, we fall short. The goalposts move. It is a fragile, fragile existence that can be yanked right out from under us so fast it will make your head spin. That is the life and life more abundantly, but I will also say, Jesus means life eternal. And one day when I am standing before God, the creator of heavens and earth, I don't want to be standing on anything I have done, accomplished, made, or was just associated with. I want to be standing on the one who is the way, truth, and life eternal. And that's it. Amen. That's what Jesus is saying. You want life abundant? I'm the way. You want life eternal? I'm the way. And if you want to be one of my sheep, hear my voice and follow me. So where does that leave us? We have to learn to listen to the voice of the shepherd. And I will tell you, it's hard because like that parking garage in San Antonio, there's a lot of voices in our world, folks. <laughs> It's a mess. They're bouncing off the walls. We are blessed and cursed with a scream of an arm's reach at any given moment. But at the end of the day, we hear these voices. Whether it's the media, who, even though we want to trust reporting, makes money off terror and fear because it draws your eyes and ad dollars. When the shepherd's true voice says there is hope in me. Or whether it is the one of a million advertisers that says wear this mascara, do this diet plan, do whatever this is, then you'll look good enough. Or the insidious ads that make it look like, you know what, if you had this type of car, you'd have the type of life you want. If you drank this type of beer, that would show really good looking women hanging out with those guys. <laughs> No, the world exists to feed itself off of getting into that search for identity. Into putting those voices into our heads. Even now it seems like if I think of something or mention it to my wife in private, the next day my computer screen is going to be full of advertisements for it. <laughs> swear at this point the toaster is listening to me. <laughs> we have all these voices. And then sometimes, the worst of all, we have our own voice competing with the voice of Jesus. Our own voice that so carefully studies the rearview mirror and go, man, I can't be part of that sheep fold. How could I ever be the one he loves? How could I ever be a beloved child of grace after what I've done and been through or how I've been treated? Sometimes our own voice is the one who competes with the voice of the true shepherd in our lives. Or on the other hand, Maybe you're blessed. And we look and say, well, yes, I'm not perfect, but at least I'm not that bad. At least my family is not like that. At least I'm not over here doing this. I don't have it. That competes with the true voice saying he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except through him. And then there's all these voices in our society and culture that imprint their own value. Forget the world is not its own source of life, therefore, it cannot be the source of yours. There's an instance of this about two or three years ago, a Super Bowl commercial that struck me as the values it was trying to impart. And here's the I'm not a big sports ball fan, sure, go team, do the thing, get the points, but I love watching Super Bowl commercials, they're really well done. I was watching at this youth party, and it was a commercial for a certain car. 
the brand can remain nameless because I actually like them and maybe have one someday. But it starts out with a priest gets in the car. And he goes and he picks up a rabbi in the car. And then he picks up an imam, the kind of community leader for Islam. And they're all together, and you figure out they're going to a football game. And here's the deal. That's not problematic at all. I absolutely think you can be friends and treat as neighbor and colleague people of another faith. I think, as a matter of fact, if we had friends who saw things from another point of view and another worldview, maybe the world would be a little better place. However, my objection came at the very last. As these guys pulled up to the stadium, it said the brand name, because here we're all just fans. What value is that in party? What is that voice saying? Out here in the world, these little things like religion may divide you, but in our Coliseum, you're all just fans. You may have these small gods out there, but who is the God here that unifies you? I don't know about you, but to me, that is advertising telling me there's another way to help, to help wholeness, joy, and peace eternal that is not God. Because they're saying you have all of these divisive things of different faith traditions, but here, they don't matter. Heartbroken. Sickening. Maybe I'm overreacting, but I like to think I'm not. Guys, there are voices competing for our attention, competing for our affection, competing for our dollars and our time and our insecurity. So much so that it is crucial, I think now more than ever, that we listen to the voice of the true shepherd. And how do we do that? Well, there's no secret knowledge, no boom, I got you moment in this sermon. Sorry if that's what you were expecting. But to study the voice of the true shepherd, we kind of have to be like those sheep with their shepherd. And it's simple stuff, but it's hard and it takes time. That those sheep knew their shepherd's voice because they lived with they walked with him every single day. They bedded down to his song at night and were guided by his voice during the day. Do we, in seeking the voice of our true shepherd, do we do the same? Are we spending the time we should in those words the shepherd left behind in the Gospels? Are we spending time in our prayer lives actually expecting to encounter him, or do we just run through that prayer list of God be with so and so, God grant this, and reduce God to a cosmic Santa Claus? Or are we praying, expecting to hear that still small voice that will tell me what the shepherd's voice is saying and doing in a world that is so, so noisy? And finally, this is not directly in the scripture, but I think I can make this assertion about discerning the shepherd's voice, is that it's maybe not meant to be done alone. Because here's the thing, I'm sure not every single one of those sheep ever one time knew exactly what the shepherd was doing. Not every one of those animals got it right. But they were part of a flock. And when they saw their flock that they had spent and done and been through life with, pursuing this shepherd, they oh yeah, that's my shepherd, I should go over there. I think maybe the life of discerning our shepherd's voice is also not meant to be lived and done alone. For those right here, maybe that is leading into a Bible study you had before, or a Sunday school class, or knowing someone of a great and deep faith, whether from this church or another, and saying, let's start getting called. It is leaning into those relationships with those sheep who you know, know the shepherd's voice. They're the most enriching in our lives. And we really have kind of three groups worshiping here today. We have y'all who that applies to, and we also have those worshiping with us online that have 
miracle of technology. As I said earlier, a lot of these voices about Marcus are bad. But thank God we get to extend beyond our back walls. And among those, we kind of have two groups. We have our church family who are part of this flock and community and are just not here because of health, safety, or a myriad of other reasons. To you, church, thank you. And if you're one of those who cannot join us right now, reach out to us. We would love to bring you communion. We would love to be in fellowship with you so that you can be more fully a part of our flock. But then there's a third audience, and that is those people who sometimes from all over, near and far, stop it. If that is you, thank you. We are so glad and so blessed that you are here. But I beseech you to find a local where you are, where the shepherd's voice is proclaimed, and be there. My mic die again? <laughs> nice. I can hear you. You can hear me? Well, I learned to whisper in a helicopter, so I've been told, because I'm not that quiet. <laughs> but no, to those stopping in, there is no replacement for that community. And this service will be here. You can watch it any time. And if you're looking for a local church somewhere in the blessed land called the Texas Hill Country, I know a good one. There's my shameless plug. But guys, no. As sheep, it is not meant to be lived alone. Spend the time. Spend the relationships with those who know the true shepherd and prioritize those relationships in your life. Because, friends, we have to make Christ our way to the life abundant that we are seeking. Because all other ways come up short and we deny it. And in a world full of voices bombarding us, playing on our insecurities for the things that they need, we need to be able, on our own and together, discern the voice of the true shepherd. Because for us, for me and you, church, there is no other key. together. The one who protects us, the one who provides for us, makes that provision known at this table. A table at which we remember how on the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, 
and broke it and said, This is my body broken for you. Take and eat of it in remembrance of me. And we also remember how after supper he took the cup from the table and said, This cup, this ordinary cup is no longer ordinary. It is a cup of a new covenant in my blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. So sisters and brothers, sheep of this sheepfold. And on this World Communion Sunday, we take communion with millions and millions of sisters and brothers around the world in proclaiming our Lord's death and life and resurrection until he comes again. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, in the quietness of this house and in the sacredness of this hour, we seek your presence. Help us to know that we are in spiritual communion with all groups of Christians the world around who meet at this table today. As we break this bread together, help us to remember our Savior, whose body was broken upon the cross. As we partake of this cup, may our eyes be open to see you more clearly and our hearts quickened to serve you more faithfully. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. These are the gifts of God and the people of God. Thanks be to God.
our tithes and offerings to you. Bless and use these to accomplish your will through this church and community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We come to this table because the shepherd invites us. We have heard his voice and answered the call. And as such, we have an obligation, and that is to extend that call, extend that invitation based on grace on earth. Every time we get ready to leave this table. So if you have heard the call of the Good Shepherd on your life and would like to make a confession of faith, or if you would like to formally join this sheepfold in how we are living into the voice of the Shepherd here at FCC Herbal, please come forward during the hour of the invitation. Thank you.